Okay. <clears throat> well, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Nathan, and um, I work with Greg in the Neuroprosthetics Lab. Um, and Fred asked me to talk about classification, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, no, I mean, I yeah, I, I really wanted to talk about cl classification, so that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, all right, so since this is uh, just an introduction, um, I wanted to start off with a few basics. Uh, a classifier, so what is a classifier? So a classifier is a decision rule uh, that is found from a set of data that is used to assign labels to new inputs that may not be part of the original data set. Um, so actually, you would use a regression algorithm when you wanted to predict uh, continuous data, um, uh, as Greg showed. But you would use classification when you need to assign discrete labels to your data or class, you know, assign them to classes. Um, so the first graph here shows um, um, uh, shows a 2D input space. Um, with colors, the class labels. Uh, the line between the colors that divides the input space is called the decision boundary. Uh, in general, the boundary can have any shape, like in this picture, it's a quadratic shape. Uh, but a linear classifier is defined as a function that divides the input space with flat lines or planes, like in the second graph here. Um, however, you should know that the operations involved in a linear classifier uh, are not all linear. Um, only the decision boundaries uh, are, are linear. So in this presentation, I'm only going to be demonstrating linear classifiers. Uh, all right, so obviously, the classifier you use really depends on the application. There's no single best classifier. Uh, one of the considerations is how many classes you need to be able to distinguish between. Uh, some of the classifiers are naturally designed for binary classification, uh, like the perceptron or support vector machines. Uh, these classifiers can divide input space into two regions only. So there are ways to combine binary classifiers to form multi-class classifiers that may be appropriate for your need. Uh, one method is to create several one, cla one class versus all other class classifiers, like in this figure over here. The left one. Um, <laughs> Uh, another option is to make binary classifiers between each pair of classes, like in the right figure. Um, but in general, however, these methods produce ambiguous zones in the input space, like, like shown here. So like this one, uh, the left one is one versus all, so you have C1 and not C1, and C2 and not C2, but up there you don't really know what's going on. Um, <clears throat> but other types of classifiers can more, can more easily be generalized to multiple classes, like the least squares classification or logistic regression. Um, but both types are really very interesting and worth learning about in case you ever need one. Uh, sometimes a binary classifier is like really useful and works really well and is all you need. Uh, so I'm going to give a brief functional explanation of the four classifiers listed here. And if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me at any time. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I guess a binary classifier, uh, let's say you were, you know, doing some kind of medical exam, you would need to uh, know if, like, you know, sick or not sick. That would be a good example of binary classifier. Uh, and in a multi-class classifier, what I use, what I use it for is uh, decoding um, uh, neural signal, or decoding reach target from neural data. So that would be a good example, I think, of multi-class classifier. Or Oh. Uh, sorting neurons is uh, actually done, usually done with dimensionality reduction uh, and with a technique called PCA, which I think Fred is going to get into later, and that's not something that is usually done with classification like this. But uh, you can do some kind of clustering, which can also use classification, but I guess Fred will talk about it. They're, yeah, they're, they're both machine learning algorithms. They both try to look for uh, uh, patterns uh, in the data. Um, so they are similar in that way. Yeah. Right, Fred? OK. <laughs> All right, so the first off, first off is the least squares algorithm. Uh, I like it because I think it's the simplest method, and it's the easiest to visualize. Uh, it's also a good starting point for many problems, just to see if your data may be linearly separable. Uh, the equation is pretty simple. So it's, it's up there. The output is just a linear combination of the input, and then some decision threshold is used uh, to place each new input into a class. <clears throat> the weight vector is found using the least squares regression that Greg talked about. 
Okay. So, uh, it's easiest to visualize uh, with one dimensional input and two classes with labels plus one and minus one. Uh, the decision thres threshold would be zero in this case. Um, uh, so, you fit a line to the data, and then any new input is projected onto the output uh, with the line. If the output is le less than zero, it is assigned the minus one class. This places the decision boundary at x1 is equal to eight. I guess I thought it would be bigger, but. So here's a line that you fit to your to your data. You see there's really two classes, uh, and y is like the class label. Uh, one is you know class one, minus one is class two, um, and then you fit a line to it, uh, and the decision threshold is at y is zero, which projected onto the input uh, dimension is at uh, eight. So anything below eight would be class two, anything above eight would be class one. Um, and in two dimensions, it's like you're fitting a plane. So it works similarly, but uh, you're just fitting a plane and so on and so on. Um, for more than two cases, it's easy to use a one of k output instead of a single output. So here's an example of how you would do that. Uh, if, you, if you wanted to do one of k coding scheme, here's an example of uh, four classes, and this would be class three. Right, can you see that? Um, but some problems with this are that uh, it's weak to outliers. Um, it doesn't like it when points are far from their class mean, uh, like here, in figure t uh, in the second figure here. Uh, here, everything's nice and like clustered around the mean, but when you have some outliers, the linear classifier, which is the purple line, um, doesn't do so well. It starts misclassifying things, even though it could easily classify things properly, like this green line does, which is uh, logistic regression. But I'll get into that uh, in a couple slides. Um, uh, yeah. So, sorry, which one? The K. Okay, yeah. Yeah. No, that's the thing. You only do one of K. So your regression actually goes from uh, however many input dimensions you have to K output dimensions. And your training set, you set it up so that uh, if something is in class three, it'll be zero, zero, one, zero. And if something is Class one, it'll be one zero zero zero. Uh, you could have something in. Uh, you, uh, oh, I, I see what you're saying. So when you when you set it up like this, you wanna you wanna decide what class a new vector w a new input would be in, and you would do that by choosing the choosing the maximum of your uh, regressed uh, input. Yeah. Good question. I, I forgot to mention that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then you regress to that. And then for a new one, you would apply the, uh, the weight vectors to your new input and then see which one of the K output spots is the maximum. And you would choose. Exactly. Exactly, so you would choose, yeah, yeah. Make sense? Yeah. All right, um, okay. Sure. Yeah. So that's your training data. This would, yeah, this is a training set with really one dimensional input and one dimensional output, so it's really like super simple, like super basic. Yeah, yeah, good question. You need a training set to, to learn the rule, the classification rule. Um, and then you apply the classification rule to the new data, uh, and you hope that it works well. <laughs> That's, yeah. Thank you for that question. It's a good one. Um, OK, uh, so yeah, so I was talking about issues with this. So another issue is sometimes uh, when there are fewer dimensions than classes, uh, you get some weird things going on, like over here. Uh, there's these these data are like really easily linearly separable, but the linear classifier or the least squares classifier does a pretty bad job of of classifying them. Um, so you may need to find something else in cases like that. But in general, it does pretty well, actually. In, in my experience, it does does really well. So. Uh, this problem that I talked about, the outliers, is uh, a problem known as overfitting, which happens, it's like your worst enemy in machine learning. It sucks. It's 
like you think you found a really good one and then it does terrible on new data because you've overfit to the original data. Um, and this is like one really simple example of that. Um, but there's a technique uh, for preventing overfitting in least squares classification that I'm going to talk about um, in this slide. Uh, and it's called uh, regularizing or regularized least squares. So like I said, it's one solution to overfitting. Um, and the way it does it is it prefers simpler classifiers or hypotheses. Uh, so one way to simplify the set of classifiers is by forcing some coefficients to be zero. And what you're doing basically is you're ignoring some input dimensions. Uh, similarly, we could apply constraints on the norm of the weights of the classifiers. Uh, doing so has the same effect of preferring certain dimensions over others in, in different ways. So the regularized loss function uh, is like the squared loss function used for least squares, uh, but it includes a penalty for large coefficient. Um, the penalty can be different types of norms. So here's like the least squares one. It's the regular one that was, uh, that Greg talked about basically. Uh, and then here's like the penalty that you add for um, the magnitude of the weight vectors. And here's um, a coefficient lambda I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and then Q is sort of like the norm that you're using. You can use different kinds of norms. Um, <coughs> uh, here are the different kinds of norms. Y uh, these are constant contours in uh, in like norm in in the L1 norm and the L2 norm. It's like a circle, so every point on the circle has a, an L2 norm distance of one from the center. Um, but uh, the way it works, sort of, is, is it can be like seen in this graph. So uh, this graph shows the weights in weight space. So at the center of the circles would be the weight that you get from the unregularized uh, least squares uh, regression. Um, but with the penalty, it moves the weights over. And if you follow the concentric circles, uh, it moves the weights over so uh, to the point where it hits the other, the, the, the contour <laughs> of the L2 norm in this case. Um, and you can see that the way it moves the weights over really depends on the, the type of norm you use. Here, if you use the L1 norm, it completely ignores uh, W1 and focuses all the way to W2. So that's like one way of uh, ignoring one of the dimensions or giving less weight to one of the, one of the dimensions, and that prevents overfitting. Um, and the parameter lambda is very important. It controls how much, uh, how much attention you give to this sort of like whole weighting process. And usually you find that by cross-validation. So you, um, cross, you use cross, I'm, I'm not gonna explain what cross-validation is. If you wanna ask, you can ask it later. But uh, yeah, sorry. in terms of your coefficient being generated? Okay, so, yeah, if you go, let's go back, oh, sorry, spoilers. Okay, so here, this is um, overfitting by paying too much attention to these guys. So these guys have a really large uh, square distance from uh, the, their class mean, and the regression, the, the, the algorithm is trying to fit it, sorry? Exactly, exactly. And if you, if you pay less attention to um, the dimensions that they're, like, you know, that they're further away from the mean in, then you can, then you can focus less on them. Okay. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, like I said, um, a way to do it is to simplify your classifier, right? So having a complicated classifier usually means having too many parameters. If you have fewer parameters, uh, it's probably, it's, it's better in general. The least parameters is better, like you can have an intuitive feeling of that. Uh, but yeah, if you have more parameters than you need, you're definitely gonna overfit. Okay. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Actually, yeah, this, this um, the, the regularized least squares can also be used for regression. I didn't mention that, but uh, it's a good tool for regression. You can fit it in. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Good question. Yeah, I didn't include it. There's a there's an equation very similar to the one Greg showed for least squared that includes the lambda parameter, and it'll give you the solution. But that's uh, that's if uh, you use the L2 norm. I haven't checked if there's one for the other types of norms, but I know there's one for the L2. Question? No? Stretching? Okay. Uh, so. Yeah, so I was talking about cross-validation. I'm not going to explain what cross-validation is. If you're curious, we can talk about it later. But you find this parameter lambda um, <coughs> through cross-validation. <laughs> I know you're all curious. <laughs> all right. Okay, so next, logistic regression. Okay, so uh, I'm going to present how logistic regression works for two classes with the plus one and minus one labels that we had before. So the motivation is really based on probability theory. Uh, using Bayes' theorem, we can write the probability of being in a certain class given an input like so. So uh, this is, you know, Bayes' formula, and then it's rearranged. Um, and then uh, there's the sigmoid function, which I didn't include, but trust me that it's, um, it can be written like this in the sigmoid function. Um, and so you get this logarithm of the ratio of these two guys. Logarithm of the ratio of these two guys inside the sigmoid, um, and this figure is actually what the sigmoid function looks like. In case you're curious, um, so if we assume what's inside the sigmoid function over here is a linear combination of the input, then we have a nice simple model for our conditional probability like this. So uh, what's really interesting about Gaussian uh, probability. Uh, PDFs or probability density functions is that uh, this assumption is true. Um, if you have these class, these conditional distributions uh, as Gaussian, then the sigmoid function, then it reduces to this. You get a linear combination of the inputs inside your sigmoid function. Okay. Um, so then to pick a class, we just pick the class with the highest uh, probability, naturally. Right? So, um, now, so to find the parameters, what we do is we can write the probability of observing our data set as a function of W. So right here. So each, this is each point. It's the probability uh, of, each, of each point, and the product, this is the product. Um, and so this is like the class label, and then this is the input vector. And so you multiply those, and it, um, uh, it can be written like this, because this is the uh, class probability, like, like we showed here, and this is either one or zero. Oh, I, sh I said minus one, but it, it could. Uh, I, I made a typo here. It's one or zero, um, and then it's either this probability or one minus it because there are only two classes. Um, and this process is actually called maximum likelihood solution. And then you can use stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent on it. Uh, maximum likely. I mean, the reason I went into this is kind of detailed, but maximum likelihood is is like a big sort of parameter estimation. Um, tool and you use and it's used to estimate parameters by writing things in terms of uh, the probability and then trying to maximize the probability by varying the parameter that you're you're trying to fit. Okay. Uh, next one. Okay. So the perceptron. Okay. So I really chose this because it actually has the coolest name, uh, but it also has a nice property of being uh, naturally online. So like it can update like in real time kind of. Um, so if you ever need something that's fast and binary, I would use this. Um, the equations are really simple. It's a linear combination of the input uh, and then pass through a step function to assign the labels. Like you see here. Uh, the way it updates the weights is actually pretty cool also. So there's uh, this equation, which is a variation of the gradient descent. Um, we start with a random weight vector and cycle through the new input. If a new training point is misclassified, then we update the weight vector by adding or subtracting uh, the, the input vector. So this is like a demonstration of the steps of how it happens. So here's your like n initial like random starting vector, and then here this point is misclassified. Uh, so you add that to the weight vector. And then it shifts it. It, sh it moves the weight. It moves the um, the weight vector like this. And then this point is also misclassified. You add it to the weight vector, and it moves it like this. And ta-da, classified perfectly. 
So <laughs> the perceptron algorithm is uh, guaranteed to converge if the data are linearly separable, but in practice it works pretty well even when they're not linearly separable. So it's a good one to try. So, support vector machines. So this one is like famous, I think. I don't know, it's the one I heard of before all the other ones. Um, it's, it's really commonly used. The complete details are pretty complicated, so I thought I would just sort of present the basic ideas. I can provide more resources if anybody's curious later. Um, the algorithm, so what it really does is it aims to maximize the margin between two separable classes. Um, like you, you see here, this is class one, class two, and they're separable. Um, uh, the margin is based only on a few support vectors uh, at the edges of the classes, um, like, like you see here. So what, what they found is the maximum uh, margin between the two, and it really, what's great about this is that it only depends on a few of the points. So if you have a separable class and you have like a bunch of outliers, it's sort of like naturally robust to outliers in a certain in this kind of way because like if you can have whatever kind of distribution you want of this class over here and it won't care about them as long as like you can make a nice margin between a few support vectors. Okay, but the algorithm also works when the data are not separable. So there's uh, the technique they use is they introduce some slack variables um, and then they use a different kind of optimization equation to find the margin. Uh, it still works really well. I didn't include the details but it's, it's great. I love it. Um, but in practice, uh, what you actually see is you see the support vector being used in feature space. So um, imagine like before you had like the linear classifier um, here. So this was like your input space. So if you change um, the input space to be features of the input. So instead of, let's say you, your, your input is like five dimensions, um, then you can make a feature that has three dimensions, um, but it can be some kind of weird function of, of each input vector. So like it can be like the square of the first two uh, elements of the vector plus the, I don't know, the cube of the second two or something like that. So that's called, that's called those are features. Uh, and so uh, what happens is what, when something is uh, not linearly separable in input space, like shown here, it may be linearly separable in feature space if you find the right features. And that's a whole like art and a whole like um, whole process, very involved, trying to find the right features and feature selection, etc. Um, and so, what's great is that if you SVM can be easily easily applied to feature space, and it might produce really nice results in feature space, and then when you project it down, the margin here is not a flat line, but uh, really it's a linear classifier, in case you're confused about that. Because I always, I always saw this picture and I was like, oh, I didn't know SVM was linear because it looks so non-linear. All right. <laughs> okay, so the one last, me one last method I wanted to mention, um, and I didn't include it before because it's not really a classifier, but it's very useful. Uh, it's it's useful for dimensionality reduction, and it's called Fisher's Discriminant. Um, it's very interesting. Consider that you have two classes. So Fisher's Discriminant will find the direction of the line that will maximize the class mean separation while minimizing the within class variance when the data are projected onto the line. So that was a mouthful, but what uh, what happens here is you're finding the direction of a line that when the data is projected onto the line, you get really good mean separation and really low within class variance. So here uh, is the one that actually has optimal mean separation, but you can still misclassify points and the variance is kind of high. And here, uh, you're projecting the data onto this line and you see that the variance is really, it's like it's really tight and the means are reasonably far apart and so this is like the optimal, this is Fisher's discriminant line that he, that's found here. Yeah, please. Uh, I, yes, I think so. I think. Yeah, 
yeah, I think yeah, I think you're thinking of like a visual analogy of PCA, right? Is that sort? Oh, okay. I think so. But uh, yeah, so what you're doing is really trying to find a way to separate them well, and and there's an equation that I didn't include that optimizes that by maximizing the the mean, the classes, the difference between the class means, and minimizing the variance between the classes, and it orients the line in such a way that like that's optimized. Okay. Um, but it's it's not a classifier. It just projects the data into lower dimensions. And so later on, you can use logistic regression or something else to classify it. Uh, actually, uh, the using logistic regression is motivated by the central limit theorem because a linear combination of the data will start approaching a Gaussian distribution. And so logistic regression is probably a good choice for that. So as everyone promised, I was going to talk a bit about decoding. Um, and I just, yeah, just like another I mean, I could stop it right here. It's just another. Yeah, it's the last slide. Sorry, am I am I really long? <laughs> oh, okay, great. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Great. Okay, good. Okay. So um, I wanted to give an example just of what I'm using uh, some of the uh, classifiers for, um, and the one example that I'm working on now is I'm decoding from data collected by. Greg, who's in my lab, uh, I'm decoding reach target intention from about 20 neurons. So um, in like a trial, the monkey is sitting and waiting, and he's waiting to be instructed on which direction to reach to. And then there's something called the memory period where he, has to, where he doesn't see the reach cue anymore, but he has to sit and hopefully think about where he's going to reach to. So this is um, the decoding performance um, of the three different classifiers here um, uh, over time uh, aligned to the start of the memory period. So um, the at time zero is when the queue is shut off. So he doesn't see the queue anymore and he's thinking about reaching. And well before time zero is when he, the experiment hasn't really even started yet. So before that time, decoding performance is about 25% which is good because that's chance level. You don't want to be any higher than that before the monkey knows where he's going to reach. And then when the queue comes on, the performance jumps way up to 90%. So the data is like really like separable at that point. Um, and then in the middle of the memory period, he's thinking about reaching and we get to like about 70% performance, which is pretty cool, I think, because you know that really means that you can sort of like extract uh, the reach intention to some like extent from his data using uh, classifiers. And I should say, so the blue line is a linear classifier, which I was surprised, but it really does the best in this case. It's like really simple, doesn't overfit, does a good job. And this one is the normal Bayes, which is like very similar to the logistic regression. I didn't talk about it exactly. And this is the log normal Bayes. It fits uh, log normal instead of a Gaussian distribution. So i just showing those three here. Um, and that's it. That's my example. Yes, please, questions. Uh, does all decoding? I don't know if all decoding. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think it is. Um, yeah, I mean, you want to, you want to, I mean, the idea of decoding is to classify some new input that you haven't really seen before, which is the firing rate of neurons, um, and sort of assign a label to it. In this case, it's like reach direction label. So, um, uh, if you can do that well, then you're you're decoding. That's what you're doing. So maybe there's another way to do it, but I think linear classification or classification in general is perfectly suited for that. 